Welcome everyone to section number three. This is the fundamental theorem of line integrals. And really before we get into the fundamental theorem, right, this video, uh, our, our objectives are to say, right, really sometimes traveling from a point A to a point B, maybe it doesn't matter so much how it's done, interestingly enough. So in this video, we're going to suggest that some vector fields are special. Right? And then we're going to start giving definitions to some of these special vector fields. And so in t really to understand what I mean by right, traveling from A to B, who cares how it's done, or suggesting that some vector fields are special, I have this example for us. Right? And so let's do A together, and then I'm going to give you guys a chance to do B and C, and then kind of we'll think about D uh, again all together. So let's try A here. I would like to move from the point 0, 0 to 1, 1. Right? And here's our vector field right here. Uh, we're going to be calculating out this line integral that was introduced last time. And, and we're going to parameterize the first time that we're going to travel. We're going to travel by t, t, right? as t travels from 0 to 1. So again, as when t is 0, we start at 0, 0. When t is 1, we end at 1, 1. So you can see if we were to draw maybe the picture here, this is a later example, right? It would be just a straight shot from 0, 0 to 1, 1. So that's part A. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. The first thing we have our parameterization. Let's go ahead and calculate out our dr. Well, that's going to be just 1, 1 dt. And so in this case, our integral along our curve of f dot dr is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of, let's see, f, which is 2x, 2y. So I'm going to do 2t. 2t, right, because x is given by t and y is given by t along this curve, times 1, 1 dt, right, so that's our dr value. All right, so let's go ahead and integrate this thing, or let's simplify first, I suppose, right, so this is the dot product, 2t times 1, that's 2t, plus 2t times 1, that's another 2t, so altogether 4t dt. And so now we can go ahead and integrate this. I think we get 2t squared, evaluate this from 0 to 1, and I believe our final answer is 2. Okay, so let's go ahead and try traveling along a few different paths. So in this case, uh, we're going to parameterize the curve by t, t squared, right? So this is part A for part B here, t, t squared. Again, you can see at 0, you'd be getting out 0, 0. At 1, you'd be getting out 1, 1. But this time, we're going to be traveling along the parabola. Right? So traveling along a nice parabola from 0, 0 to 1, 1. So go ahead and pause the video. When you're done with this, you can unpause it, and let's go over the results together. All right, so you can see that all the kind of intermediate steps are different. Right? So dr, in this case, when you take the derivative here, you're going to get 1 and 2t dt. And then when you evaluate out your line integral, well, you're going to have 2x, x is t, and then 2y, y is t squared, so that's 2t squared. You do the dot product, and you do, and, and you get 2t plus 4t cubed. Uh, when you integrate this, you get t squared plus t to the fourth. You evaluate that from 0 to 1. You get, however, the same answer, right? So even though all the intermediate steps were different, you got the same answer. All right, let's try this one more time with C, right? C is going to, uh, sorry, part C, where the curve C is parameterized by sine of pi t over 2 comma t squared. So in this case, if you were to use some like graphing software or something else, it looked kind of a little bit more circular. It looks something like this. So again, if you plugged in 0, you would get 0, 0. If you plugged in 1, you would get 1, 1. So we're still traveling from the point 0, 0 to 1, 1, but now we're traveling along a different curve. Okay, so again, pause the video, try to get as far as you can, then we'll go ahead and spoil the surprise. All right, and in this case, right, we calculate out our dr, so we have our nice parameterization given to us up here. Calculate out the dr. Oops, I guess I forgot my dt in this case. Right over there. Okay, and then we evaluate out our line integral. So we have 2x, 2y. So we're plugging in, you know, the sine of pi over 2t everywhere we see x. We're plugging in the t squared everywhere we see y. We take the dot product. Here's that. And now we go ahead and integrate this. Now with the sine cosine, you know that this should be like a sine squared or something like this. And if you take the derivative of this, notice that you will get back to where you started with. Kind of that 2 comes down, but then when you use the chain rule here, 
that pi over 2 kind of comes out and saves the day, right? And this just gives us the pi. So the 2 on top and the 2 on bottom, they'll cancel out. Evaluate at 0 to 1, and in fact, you will get 2. So in all three of these cases, right, we always got the answer 2. And so the final step is to evaluate out this line integral right here from 0, 0 to 1, 1. And maybe you already noticed, but like this curve is given to us, right? It's kind of back and forth, back and forth. We parameterize it many, many times, right? And we go all the way to all up here to 1, 1. So I travel along that entire curve right there, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, still starting from 0, 0 and ending at 1, 1. And right, we're not going to actually calculate that out, but hopefully after doing 1, 2, and 3, we would all guess that the answer to this last bit, or I guess this answer to D here, is 2. And in fact, we would be right. Okay, and so as I suggested up here in the objectives, right, we're going to suggest that some vector fields are special. There is something special about this vector field 2x and 2y, which means that it doesn't really matter which path you take. So long as you start and end at the same point, every line integral will give you the same result, which is pretty remarkable because look at all of these intermediate steps. They're completely different from one another. Okay, so let's formalize this a little bit with some definitions. Okay, so F is a vector field defined in open region D in space. You can also do in planes. Suppose that we have any two points, A and B, uh, that are inside of D, and we have this nice line integral that we're interested in calculating out. Right? So the path C from A to B that stays in D is the same over all curves. Then the line integral is called, sorry, the integral is called, blah, 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 path independent. So this is the phrase that we're giving to if it doesn't really matter how you travel from A to B, you get the same result. In the last case, it was two every single time, right? We're calling these things path independent. And so we also want to develop some mathematics to help us know when is a field, when is this vector field going to be path independent, right? Or not. And it turns out that path independent fields are conservative. So hopefully we remember what conservative means, right? It came up in 16.1. It means that, right, it has a potential function, that there's a, uh, that it's the gradient field for some function. So let's put it all together here in this theorem. So suppose F is a vector field uh, that's continuous in an open connected region D. And we want to calculate out this line integral, right? And it's independent of the path D. Then F is conservative vector field on D. That is, there exists a function little f so that this capital F, right? This vector field right here is the gradient of little f. Right? So this is, in another term would be a gradient field. So again, this theorem says the only way you get path independent is if you have a conservative vector field. That is, that your vector field, it comes from, you know, some function, right? It's the gradient of some function. And so, in fact, let me skip all these definitions really quick and let's go down here and let's stare at our vector field really quick. Can we think of any functions, f of x, y, that have the gradient 2x, 2y. So remember, you would take the x partial derivative in the first component, you would take the y partial derivative in the second component. And I hope the answer is yes, that we can think of it. You should pause the video if you haven't gotten there yet. But the answer is yes, f uh, of x, y is equal to maybe like x squared plus y squared, right? If you take the x partial derivative, f sub x, you would get out 2x. If you take the y partial derivative, you would get out 2y. And so therefore, the gradient of f would be 2x comma 2y. So in fact, this was right, a conservative vector field. All right, so let's go ahead back here. I skipped over some definitions, and I kind of you know zoomed past a few of these things, continuous, open, connected, region D, right? 
kind of skim past these. Let's stare at some of these things really quick, some definitions that we're going to need for this theorem and actually for some upcoming theorems as well. So first of all, we have a region D is open. If for every point P in D there exists a disk with center at P that lies entirely in D, blah, 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 which means basically that it doesn't include any of its boundary points or that it's right, kind of a dotted line sort of deal. So let's go ahead and sketch one of these uh, lines uh, or regions here. So again, it's not going to include any of its boundary points. right? That's what it's going to mean for it to be open. So I'm going to go ahead and sketch. This is my region D. And the technical math definition here for what does it mean to be open is that for any point P in D, so whether you take P to be right here, or maybe let's take it really, really close to B, in, in, close to the edge here. You can take it in the middle, wherever you want. Any of these can be P's, right? For any point P inside of D, so here's my region D, I guess I should label that. There is a disk with center at P that lies entirely in D. So it just basically means that you can draw a circle, right, to make a little disk here, and that disk stays entirely within D. So this disk right here, and remember, it's just there exists. So it's not saying that every disk would do this, but there is some disk, right, a small enough radius. So maybe here we can choose a rather big radius. But here, because this one's quite close, you would have to choose kind of a very, very small radius. The idea is because you don't have these uh, these dashed lines included, right, because these points are included, you can find a small enough radius. There's a, a distance between this point and this dotted line, right, and you can make your uh, disk maybe have that radius. So all of these disks lie inside of D. So that's what it means to be open. Remember, we actually already have a definition for a closed region. We brought that up back in 14.7 when we were dealing with absolute minimums and absolute maximums. So now we kind of have both, open and closed. All right, next, a region D is connected if any two points in D can be joined by a path that lies in D. So for instance, this one right here, this region is connected. So we'll say this is open and it's connected. Any two points that you were to pick here, maybe I'll use orange. So if I do A and I do B, we can connect these with a path. So something like this. And right, the path's not unique. There are many paths that work, but just so long as there exists at least one path, we're fine. Now, what gets us into trouble is when you have stuff like this. So suppose that these two things together make up the region D. Right? So a fairly complicated equation if we were trying to write it all down, but okay. So this right here makes up our D. This is not connected. Right, because if you have an A over here and a B over here, and if you want to connect these things, well then notice any path that you have that joins together A and B has to leave the region D. Right, there's a place where it leaves the region. And so that means that it's not connected, right? So that's the big thing here is that connected, any two points can be joined by a path that lies in D. So the fact that it doesn't lie in D in its entirety, right, this means that it's not connected. We know what it means for a region to be closed. Now, when we say closed in terms of a curve, this is, again, it's an idea that we've brought up. In fact, back when we were parametrizing things, we talked about closed curves. It means that its terminal point is the same as its initial point, right? So something like this would not be a closed curve. However, something like this, where you start and end at the same point, this is closed. So this is closed curve. This is not closed curve. Okay, so if you start and end at the same point, this is what we mean by a closed curve. A simple curve is a curve that doesn't intersect anywhere ex between its endpoints. So for instance, this closed curve right here is simple. So why don't I go ahead and I'll mention this is simple. Uh, this also is simple, right? An example of a non-simple curve would be something like this. So this, uh, this curve right here, right, it intersects someplace that's not its endpoints. So not simple. It's also not closed. Likewise, if you wanted to, you could make a not simple closed curve, right? You could do something like the figure eight or the infinity sign, right? So this is closed, but 
it intersects someplace that's not its endpoints, right? It intersects right here. So this is also not simple. So you can have simple closed curves, you can have simple non-closed curves, right? You kind of have all the combinations that you'd like. All right, and then finally, a simply connected region. Well, it's gonna be kind of friends with connected, right? But a simply connected region in a plane is a connected region D such that every simple closed curve in D encloses only points that are in D. Hua. Basically, when you see this, I want you to think no donuts or no holes. No donuts or holes in D. So for instance, if we went ahead and we made this donut right here and said that this is our region, right? And maybe we can make it open or something like this, right? We can have all the dotted lines. This is connected, right? Between any two points, you can find a path, right? So if you have here's point A and here's point B, you can go ahead and find a path that stays in D, right? Uh, so this is connected, but it's not simply connected because the idea is that we can make a simple closed curve, right? It says every simple closed curve, right? So there are some simple closed curves that do, that do kind of in, uh, encompass only points in D. But there are others out there, right? So we can make the closed curve like so, right? And notice that this closed curve encloses points that are not in D, right? We, only, we want it to enclose only points that are in D, right? But this includes, encloses some points that are in D, but then you notice that there's this white bit that's not in D, and it encloses that. So this right here is an example of something that's not simply connected. And again, we will be using this definition here for some upcoming uh, theorems. So that's why we have this. Also really quick, if we go back, notice that this one's not simply connected because it's not connected, right? So a simply connected region does need connected. So this is not simply connected. And then this one right here is simply connected, right? So any circle that you make, or really any simple closed curve that you make, only encompasses or encloses points that are in D. So again, basically, I want you to think no donuts or holes. So nothing like this. All right, those are all the defin definitions that we need. That's it for this video. Next time, we're going to describe this thing, the fundamental theorem of line integrals. I'll see you then.